So today we're going to continue on in this series that we've been in, looking at the last week of Jesus' life, the, those days leading up to his crucifixion, and then ending with his resurrection. And so, uh, you know, we, we're taking each week to kind of look at a different day in that last week of Jesus' life. Two weeks ago, we began this series, um, and, and it's been really good for me so far, just to start to dig into it. You know, Jesus lived, you know, scholars think around 33 years or so. Yet the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spend a dis- disproportionate amount of time talking about just really eight days in Jesus' life. Um, it's said that, like, you know, I think about 30% or so of the, of the gospels are about just those eight days. When Jesus lived, um, you know, he lived uh, many years, yet they spend a lot of extra time. And so this, this time has been come to be known as Holy Week, and Holy Week is coming up. It'll be um, towards the end of the month, leading into the first week of April, and I'm really excited to get there, but what we decided to do is we're going to take the cue of the gospel writers, and we're going to spend a disproportionate amount of time this year focusing on just these eight days in Jesus' life, and so um, each Sunday leading up until Easter, we're going to take one day, and we're going to look at that particular day, and so um, today we're going to be looking at Tuesday, all right? And so um, I'm excited about that. Tuesday was one of those days in, in the last week of Jesus. I wasn't quite sure what happened on Tuesday until I started looking into it. Because, you know, I've always kind of known Palm Sunday and Monday, what happened then. And then, you know, you've got Monday, Thursday and, and Good Friday and Holy Saturday. I kind of get those. And, of course, Easter Sunday. But Tuesday was one I wasn't quite sure about. So let me recap really quick where we've come from. So two weeks ago, we looked at Palm Sunday which is the beginning of the week, all right? And on that day, Jesus entered into Jerusalem. He had been on this journey toward Jerusalem, finally had arrived, and he entered in in dramatic fashion, riding on a colt with all these people from the country uh, along with him, shouting chants of Hosea, save us, blessed is this king and his coming kingdom. Then Jesus, on that Sunday, he came into Jerusalem, he went to the temple courts where the temple was located, and it says he just looked around at everything, and then he left, and he retreated to the city of Bethany, which is just right outside of Jerusalem, kind of like a suburb of the city, and he stayed there for the night. And so then they woke up on Monday morning, and Jesus and his disciples traveled back to the temple with his disciples. And then, we talked about this last week, he staged another very public and very dramatic thing, and this was even more so than the day before. He did this kind of direct action campaign where they went into the temple courts, and and y'all maybe know the story if you were here, you heard it last week, but he turned over the money changers' tables, and he drove out the people selling the doves, and he stopped flow of traffic and economic activity for a period of time, and really caused quite a scene in the temple courts that day. Now, the authorities in Jerusalem were already probably concerned and upset about what happened on Sunday when he came in on the cult and everybody's calling him a king. But then they were even more angry with Jesus after what he did on Monday in the temple. And they began looking, it says, for a way to kill him. Now, Tuesday, um, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark through this series. And so on Tuesday, we begin in Mark Chapter 11, verse 20. And Mark is really uh, a good one to read if you're wanting to know when the days begin and end because he usually gives markers about kind of when the day ends and when the next day begins. And so in verse 20, we actually read, in the morning as they went along. And so it's very clear that this is the next day. It's in the morning and Tuesday has begun. And so a lot happens on Tuesday, actually. It's funny that I didn't really know what happened on Tuesday because Tuesday actually gets the most amount of verses out of all the days in the Gospel of Mark. There is a lot going on on this particular day. And so you may not know what happens on Tuesday, and we're not going to talk about all of it, but we're going to get into it just a little bit. So the basic theme of Tuesday, as I've read through it, and this is what I I decided was the basic theme, is that we have increasing conflict with the authorities. When I say authorities, we're talking about kind of these religious slash political authorities in Jerusalem. And and there's lots of different folks, and we're going to talk about some of them as we move along. But what basically happened is Monday night after the action is in the temple, they left the city again, and they spent the night outside town. 
But then Jesus and his disciples came back into Jerusalem and re-entered the city. And while in Jerusalem, all day on Tuesday, it seems, they, they were hanging out and spending time right outside the temple in, in what they call the temple courts. Now, the temple itself is not all that, was not all that big, but the temple courts covered a wide um, amount of space. And so there would have been lots and lots of uh, pilgrims who had traveled from all over the place during the Passover week there um, in the temple courts that day. And so you probably would have had rabbis out there teaching. There would have been all sorts of gatherings, lots of things going on. And Jesus was there. He was a teacher. And he was in the temple courts teaching the folks about different things. And so on that day, uh, I just think honestly, like, it shows how courageous and bold Jesus really was. I mean, Jesus knew what was going on. He knew people really wanted his life. That might have been one of the reasons they were hang, spending time outside the city in Bethany early in the week, because maybe they didn't have a safe place to stay in Jerusalem because the authorities were looking for him. They were looking for a way to incriminate him. They were trying to find a way to arrest him and, and really do some harm to Jesus. And so for Jesus to be out in the open where everybody else was outside the temple just teaching on Tuesday after what he did on Monday Jesus was a very bold and courageous guy. I'm not sure. I probably would have been hiding out in a house all day after what I'd just done on Monday in the temple. I mean, he had just blocked the flow of traffic when people were trying to do their economic activities. He had called the temple a den of robbers. I mean, he had angered a lot of people. He should have laid low, but Jesus, you know, he had another agenda. And so he was out there in public with the people, teaching and loving and guiding them. So while he was teaching throughout that time, you can read uh, through uh, the different stories that you'll find in the Gospel of Mark, but he was approached by a lot of religious um, kind of slash political authorities. And virtually all of them were very antagonistic with Jesus. Um, you can see in, in the different stories when Jesus is teaching, they come up and they ask him questions, and they're not really seeking answers. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to get him to say something that might incriminate him. Um, they were smart people, these religious folks, but um, Jesus was smarter than them. And, and it's just kind of interesting how Jesus doesn't ever allow them to kind of get the best of him in these moments. And he's very clever in the way he deals with these authorities. You had folks like the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the scribes. They all keep coming to Jesus to try to stump him or cause him to say something that he would regret. But Jesus is very clever and cunning, and so he managed to avoid their tricks every time. And so what happened is they, they wanted to arrest Jesus, but they wouldn't do it in that situation because Jesus was out among the people. And what had happened, um, through a lot of my research, I'm finding that a lot of, not all, but a lot of the religious leaders had kind of been corrupted by political power. And so they had kind of gotten in, in relationships with uh, the Roman Empire, and there was a lot of money and power dynamics going on. And so your average people weren't very happy with some of the Jerusalem authorities. And so they didn't want to arrest Jesus right there in the midst of all that because a lot of the, pe the people were really with Jesus in many ways at that point. And so they would, it says many times actually in these chapters that they did not do anything because they feared the crowds. And so Jesus was out with the people, but they wouldn't do anything at that particular moment, because they were probably worried about creating a riot or something like that outside the temple. So we're going to focus on just the last few verses in Mark chapter 12. And I'm going to be reading from verse 38 through 44. And it will be on the screen if you want to open a Bible with me. You're welcome to do that also. But Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And so I'm going to read these for you. As Jesus taught, he said, Watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. 
Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all she had to live on. So I imagine some of you have heard this story. Sometimes it's referred to as the story of the widow's mite. Um, and, and it's a very interesting story. And I've heard it many times throughout my life. And it's often been used in churches around the time they're doing like stewardship campaigns. You know what those are when they're trying to get people to give money to the church. And they'll use this story as kind of a way to encourage people to give generously. And they'll say, you need to give like the widow. She gave everything and you've got to give sacrificially to support what we're doing here in the church. And I'm not trying to say it's bad motives, but I'm just saying this is what often happens. And the interesting thing is, as I was preparing to preach this sermon, I looked back to see when I had preached this sermon in the past. Surprise, surprise, I used it during one of those campaigns when we're trying to get people to give. And, uh, and so I look back and I'm like, well, that's interesting. And, and my basic idea was like, yeah, like God calls us to be generous with what we have, not just to give to the church, but to give to all sorts of things, you know, and like it's really God's money. And we got to think about how we spend it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with necessarily that kind of message. However, while there is truth to that idea, I must confess I think that I've got this scripture wrong in the past. And I'm going to explain why. I don't believe anymore that's exactly what this passage is all about. And let me explain to you how I've come to kind of a different understanding of this story. One thing that often causes us issues when we read the Bible, it can be helpful but also not so helpful, is that when you read the Bible, you'll notice there's headings above different sections of Scripture. And, and you'll have a heading, um, I think this one said something about the widow's offering. And, and so you'll see a heading over different sections, and it's actually, they were put in after the fact. These headings were not in the original text, but these have been added later to help us kind of reference things in the Bible a little easier and make sense of it. And so if I'm looking for a particular story, these headings help me because I can open it up and kind of see, oh, where does Jesus give the greatest commandment? Oh, where does Jesus uh, get tempted in the wilderness? And you can look at the headings and you can find it a whole lot easier unless it was just like a lot of like text, you know. However, these headings can also be misleading at times because what, can it, what it often can do is make us forget that like this is sometimes a continuous story and we look at one heading, and then we look at a different and think that Jesus is moving to something else. Now, let me explain what I mean. I'm going to put this on the screen. This is just an image from uh, BibleGateway.com or whatever, and this is, like, from the NIV. All right, and this is what I just read. And so today I read 38 through 44 in chapter 12. And when you look at your Bible, at least in the NIV, I'm not sure. I didn't look at all the translations. But these verses are divided into two different sections with two different headings. And looking at it, you may assume that these don't really go together, right? The first one is about warning against the teachers of the law, and the second one is focused on the widow's offering. But I actually believe they do belong together, and these headings sometimes can make us assume in our minds that these are two separate kind of things. Let me explain what I mean. In that first section, what I was reading is that you saw Jesus gave a warning about the scribes or the teachers of the law. Now, the scribes were very respected religious leaders, all right? They were the elite teachers. They knew their Bibles. They knew the history. They knew all of it. They looked important. They were probably really good public speakers. They, they lived very public lives. They received a lot of honor and praise and recognition. A Jerusalem scribe would be like the best of the best, you know, similar to like a prominent professor at like a prestigious school, right? They would get the seat of honor, respected by all. And Jesus said about them that they wore long robes, they were respected, they had seats of honor, and they prayed these long prayers. However, in Jerusalem, many of the scribes were also likely very wealthy and very powerful, Many of them were likely part of this group called the Sadducees, which were often um, a very elite group of people that had lots of money, lots of resources, owned land. And, and so you got to understand that in the ancient world, and there's a lot of truth to this today, actually, to be very wealthy and powerful in the ancient world often meant that you had to take advantage of others in order to increase your lifestyle and worth. In the ancient world, a lot of the powerful people went and basically took land from people. And it became a society where a lot of your average person didn't have land to own, and they just had to work for the wealthy people. 
And so Jesus saw these scribes had the good appearance, they had the intelligence, they had the popularity, but he also saw that they were, in fact, leaders who had been taking advantage of other people. And he specifically called them out because they devoured widows' houses. Now, we don't know exactly what Jesus meant here. Um, There's a few different arguments about what he could be referring to. It could be that these scribes were actually tasked to care for widows um, and, and manage their homes that they had for them because often women were not, it was assumed they couldn't manage them themselves, which is not true. Uh, but, but often the men, or these men would have to do this for them, and they were tasked to actually care for these widows. And it could be that maybe they were taking advantage of them. Maybe they actually took their homes from them. It could be that they were just not caring for the widows in the way that they were supposed to. The Jewish law actually required that widows be taken care of and supported. Because a widow, after a widow lost her husband, would be in a very vulnerable place in the ancient world world. And so these scribes may have been tasked with the job to care for them, but these particular leaders were accused of doing the opposite, of actually devouring them and hurting them and taking advantage of them. And so Jesus gave a warning in this first section that I showed you about the scribes and their treatment of widows. And then Mark tells us a story about a poor widow in the temple right after that. These two stories got to be related, right? There's something about the widow in the temple that is connected to the mistreatment of widows by the scribes in the verses that come before that. It seems clear to me that this passage isn't really about a generous widow whom we should imitate, though she has qualities we can imitate, but it's really about the way the powerful scribes were taking advantage of others, specifically the way they failed to care for the widows in their community. Now think about this with me. Jesus had just called out the scribes for causing financial hardship on widows in Jerusalem. And then Jesus draws attention to a poor widow in the temple. This woman may well have been one of those very widows that had been taken advantage of by those scribes he was just calling out. And so Jesus sat there by the treasury watching all the wealthy people bring their large amounts of money to contribute to the temple. They likely had big, heavy coins and lots of them. And when they threw them into the treasury, it would clank around and make lots of noise and make them look really good and really generous. And as Jesus was watching them, he saw a poor widow come and put her money into the treasury, two copper coins. These coins were called lepta in Greek. It was the smallest currency available, worth very, very little, not much of anything. And Jesus points out, And draws attention to the fact that she was living in poverty and that she gave all that she had to the temple, which wasn't very much. For much of my ministry, I thought Jesus was just telling us we got to be like her and give everything we have, right? However, when we consider the warning he gave before that about the scribes and how they looked religious yet took advantage of widows, devouring them with their harmful practices, I think we can interpret this story a little bit different. Perhaps Jesus is drawing attention to this poor widow because he wants us to see something here. Perhaps he's drawing attention as a way of confirming to what he had just said about the scribes, that they devour the widow's houses. They take advantage of them, leaving them with basically nothing. And then these scribes are expecting these same people that they take advantage of to give the very little they have to the temple which enabled the temple to continue some of the harmful practices it was engaged in, right? I've come to believe that this isn't a story. It's not just a quaint story about a woman given sacrificially, but I think it is a serious critique of an unjust system that failed to care for the vulnerable and, and really expected people to give out of their poverty. The fact that the widow had only two lepta ought to tell us something about the failure of these particular scribes who failed to fulfill their responsibility to care for widows, orphans, and strangers among them. The reality is there shouldn't have been a woman with just two lepta to her name. And she should not have felt compelled to give everything she had to a temple that was hurting her in the first place. This reading really fits, I think, with the entire kind of section of of the readings on Tuesday. Um, that we're looking at in Jesus' last week, because it's a day full of conflict with the authorities. 
many of whom had failed miserably at shepherding their flocks and caring for the people. Many folks looked religious and smart and put together in public, but as Jesus pointed out, at the same time, were taking advantage of other people and failing to care for the most vulnerable people in their community. You know, as we move through Jesus' last week, I hope it, I imagine it's becoming more clear to you why the authorities wanted uh, to execute Jesus. I mean, he was publicly rebuking their values and their alignment with the empire. Through, his, through the entry into Jerusalem, through what he did in the temple the next day when he turned over the tables. And then the next day on Tuesday, he's publicly exposing them over and over for their unjust and harmful economic practices by drawing attention to folks like this poor widow among them. You know, the, I'm just gonna, I've said this before, but the most pushback I ever receive in this church in the last few years is that my sermons can sound political sometimes. And, and I've been told, John, politics should not have anything to do with church, all right? And I understand why people think that, because when you turn on the news and you watch political discourse that is chaotic and ridiculous and, and just flat-out foolish at times, right? I understand that. I don't think any of that needs to be part of our conversation in church either. I don't think the partisan politics and power moves of our society today really don't have any place in church. However, I don't think about politics that way. Politics ultimately is about how we structure our lives together in community, how we're going to organize society so that we're really pursuing the common good, so that everybody has access to things that lead to flourishing and life and goodness, right? That's what we're trying to do, and that matters because that affects people's lives, and it affects particularly the vulnerable people's lives more than others because the powerful always usually come out okay. But the way we do politics ought to reflect our values and the way that Jesus taught us to care and love all people, right? And so, you know, this kind of stuff's all over the Bible. If you read the Old Testament and the New Testament, Jesus talked about this kind of stuff. And as we're seeing, even in his last week, he's challenging the authorities in the way they're structuring their society because they're hurting other people in the process, right? And, and a question I've pushed back at times is, if Jesus wasn't political, why did the political authorities execute him? Like, why would they have any reason to do that if Jesus wasn't saying or acting in any way that was political, right? Well, I think that they executed him because he directly challenged their harmful practices, and he came proclaiming and embodying a whole different way of structuring our life together as God's people, and, and it wasn't a way that some people wanted to see happen because it meant that they would have to give up something and change. In our book study that we're doing on this book, The Very Good Gospel by Lisa Sharon Harper, we are learning that the good news of Jesus is way more than just personal salvation and forgiveness of sin. It's way bigger than that. The good news of Jesus is that God's kingdom is coming. And that in God's kingdom, there is shalom, this biblical peace that means everybody's taken care of. That there's no poverty in God's kingdom. That poor widows don't exist in God's kingdom. Because everybody has enough and all are cared for in God's kingdom. And the religious leaders, Jesus had a hard time with them and pushed back on some of them. He wasn't pushing back on all Jews because Jesus was Jewish himself. He loved his faith. But he was pushing back on some of the leaders that had gone astray and weren't shepherding and caring for their flocks in the way God wanted them to. The job of the leaders in the community was to ensure God's shalom was being enacted here on earth. The Bible talks, refers to that as shepherding the flock with justice. That's a scriptural idea. They were entrusted with this great responsibility of ensuring that the most vulnerable were safe and well. And Jesus came inviting all to hear the good news that God's shalom was near and that all were invited to live differently in the here and now, partnering with God to bring that shalom here on earth, right in the here and now. And some people don't like hearing that kind of news. They don't like, that's not good news to everybody. That's terrifying to some because many of us don't want to change. We don't want to have to think about the common good. We want to focus on our own good, right? We don't like hearing about this new kingdom. The greedy and powerful did not want their shameful practices brought to life. 
And Jesus, though, was so passionate about the, his God's kingdom of shalom that he was willing to bring his message of light and love and care into the darkest places where evil and injustice reigned. And he took it to the very heart where he saw the corruption was the worst. And his passion for God's kingdom eventually led to his passion on the cross. And I hope that over this series, you're going to see that there were a lot of things going on and Jesus' message was not received because it was such a beautiful message of hope and light that, that when there's a lot of darkness and a lot of things that are moving against it, they don't want to see that. And my hope is that, um, is that I, maybe even just a fraction, uh, that, that I can be as passionate about God's kingdom as Jesus and have that kind of courage to continue proclaiming it and partnering with God to see this kingdom um, come in the here and now. And I think that's ultimately why Jesus was willing to give his life, because he wanted to see God's peace and God's love and God's shalom available to every last person on this earth. And we don't just sit back and, and wait for God to do it one day. I believe God has invited each and every one of us to partner with him to see this happen in the here and now, right among us today. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.